Hey, welcome back. It's Liam from Levity Books. Hope you're reading well. Today I've got a good treat for us. I'm going to be briefly explaining what I think is one of the most complex and important philosophical texts of the last century, and that is Tractatus Logico Philosophicus by Ludwig Wittgenstein. Now, I briefly mentioned this in the last video I had about um, Kierkegaard's The Present Age, and you might have noticed I'm probably building a small series here on philosophy. I don't think there's enough people dissecting philosophy on booktube. In this work, Wittgenstein argues two core ideas. First, that the limit of thought is the limit of language, and second, that the limit of language is that it must always reference real-world observations. The conclusion of these two points is that we can say or think only about what we observe, and therefore metaphysics cannot be probed by logic. So we cannot think or speak of higher principles such as God, death, or ethics, because these are metaphysical concepts which lie outside of the realm of reality. Wittgenstein concludes his work by saying that which we cannot observe and therefore cannot think or talk about, we must ignore. We cannot think about what we cannot see. And together this makes the strongest argument for agnosticism or an epicurean view of death, that it lies beyond what can be understood. I think the publication of this book in 1922 single-handedly is responsible for the death of modernism and the emergence of postmodernism which had three different branches, mainly absurdism, nihilism and existentialism, all of which were reactions to what this work is claiming, that we cannot find deep meaning or truth without a god because these truths cannot be derived from what we perceive in reality. His argument declared the death of metaphysics and of logical positivism, the latter of which was the attempt by Western societies to build an objective morality after the fall of church. In place of rational inquiry, Wittgenstein's work emphasized empirical inquiry through scientific observation, which gave way to pragmatism, but this book also shows us that scientific observations cannot answer metaphysical inquiries. Today we contest this latter point through modern neuroscience, especially in the work of my PhD, by linking disorders of perception and thought to dysfunctions in their physical substrates, which is the brain. Now it doesn't make sense for me to review this book as it's almost like a mathematical equation. It's full of dense mathematical notation, which I don't think is necessary for understanding its general claims. This book has a foreword by Bertrand Russell, who basically quit his career in analytical philosophy after this book showed that logic can only go so far. The book has six linked propositions which form its argument, which I'll now briefly describe. 1. The world is composed of knowable information that we call facts. 2. Facts are pictures, and pictures do two things. One, they convey a sense, which is the logical relationship between two objects, and two, they are either true or false relative to reality, based on testing from the physical sciences. No picture is true a priori. Three, all pictures are thoughts, and all thoughts give a full picture of the world. Now, thoughts only show how things are, not what they are, because thoughts are only references to pictures. 4. All thoughts are sentences. We think with words. Sentences themselves cannot explain the link between sentences and reality, as they are within reality. What can be shown cannot be said. Sentences are thoughts which are references of pictures, but they're only references. 5. This is where things get tricky. All sentences can be reduced to elementary truth functions. However, one true function cannot be deduced from another true function, so no observation can predict another observation. Trends cannot be logical, superstition links events. Whatever we observe could be different from what it actually is in the world, so there is no a priori order of things in the world, the individual is the limit of the world. 
This is essentially logic arguing for idealism and solipsism. And six, there can never be any surprises in logic. All deductions are a priori. They're already known. They just haven't been revealed yet. Because all thoughts are logical, they must be equal. And so any system with a hierarchy is transcendental because we can't think or talk about them. It is not how things are in the world that makes them mystical, but that it actually exists. I think this is true of biology. It's not the mechanisms which are important. It's life itself that's important. So together, these six statements emphasize the importance of seeing before thinking to know truth in the world. And this encourages people to live more in the present and it brings optimism and liveliness to all of our observations. But it also brings a lot of instability and chaos because my observations might not be your observations and we're constrained by logic. Of all things in the world, I argue that neuroscience develops Wittgenstein's theory by allowing us to actually observe the physical substrate of logic, the biological properties of the brain that are most responsible for mediating thought can be shown rather than talked about. And so by being a neuroscientist, I think you really grapple with trying to understand our limits, our real limits of perception and thought through seeing what is going on in the mind through the brain. But it does constrain us from describing them with logical syntax of language. In this case, I can never really explain to you what science is like. I can never really explain to you what seeing the brain, human brain is like. Though I've spent four years studying the human brain, I can't convey what I have observed through language to you. And what I've seen has told me about the way the brain works. So it's fascinating that this book both emphasizes the importance of science, but also shows its limits. And it also provides a core defense of Christianity against science in that scientific observations of reality can't explain things that are outside of reality. And so like other books on my channel, this is a book that profoundly influenced society. Wittgenstein should have credited William Shakespeare for influencing his idea. For in Romeo and Juliet, in Act 2, Scene 2, when Juliet says, What's in a name, that which we call a rose, by any other name would smell as sweet? William Shakespeare is getting at the arbitrariness of language to convey meaning, feeling, or thought. But it was Wittgenstein who was the first to see the real philosophical importance of that statement, and he took it to a whole other level, and he completely took the ground out of society when he made this book and changed a lot of things. That's all for now. Let me know what you think and happy reading.